Welcome to another Snap No Tap podcast. Tony Cicchini along with the one and only Joe Cardinal. Um, Happy New Year again to everybody. This is officially one week into the new year. I hope if anybody had uh, New Year's resolutions that they're already employed and doing them. And uh, I wish you continued success. Joe, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm keeping up with the resolutions. I got the garbage cleaned out of my diet for the most part, already down a few pounds, uh, keeping up with some of my workouts. I'm going to try and uh, increase the intensity on, or I should say the frequency of my workouts. Um, so yeah, uh, this month I've got a few things. School's starting up in a couple of weeks, which is going to have to shift my schedule. But yeah, everything's starting up for the new year as planned so far. So not going to- What school good. is this now? What school are you doing now? So I'm back at the uh, College of DuPage. I, you know, I don't live too far from there, uh, and it's a good school, at least uh, it's right from my level, a community college. Um, so I'm taking anatomy and physiology. So this is kind of a, a next step, uh, kind of. You know, I'd done the EMT uh, last spring, and so I'm just kind of heading, continuing to head down that, um, you know, healthcare track possibly. So we'll see. So. A lot of the requirements, whether you're going to do some nursing classes or um, paramedic school, you know, obviously anatomy and physiology, um, you know, is fundamental for those. And uh, the other thing, I'll be very curious to see, you know, if as I become more literate, uh, you know, with the little places in the body, how that will translate into the fighting skills as well, too, knowing where certain nerve points are. You know, I know you're fairly literate in the anatomy as well, and that that's contributed to your fighting skills as well. Is that not correct? Yes. And I, I made a concerted effort to study it, you know, um, and yeah, it, it'll help you for sure. Uh, so congratulations on doing that. I got to go to a healthcare specialist tomorrow. I got to go see the orthopedic surgeon because this whole arm, my left side is just, you know, it, it's just not, you know, it, whatever, you know, you get old, you get injured. So I don't want surgery. I'm not going to have surgery because I'm working out. So I'm just going to work around it. I just want to make sure to see if there's anything that physical therapy can do, or maybe deep massage. Um, I the pain in my collarbone and my lat, it seems clicks and just, well, whatever, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I'm glad you're doing your, um, uh, you know, you're continuing your education. It's good for you, man. Yeah. And at my age, I just need to do something that practices my memory. You know, I think you and I both struggle with recall and things. I think you're dealing with a little bit more heavily than I am, but just something that kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like I said, a mental exercise is part as also part of the physical exercise. So I think there's going to be a lot of terminology I'm going to have to memorize. So I'm a little intimidated by it, but I've already got the books and already start to crack into them. So um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. So Good. Yeah, um, my memory's too far gone for that. I can't remember. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, but I wish you all the success, man. I, I, I got to see the neurologist yet coming up this month, end of this month. So, you know, I've been waiting five months, I think it's been or so six months, maybe I, you lose, I lose track. Um, but anyway, so what do you want to talk about on today's show? Um, well, the well, seminars, yeah. I guess I got two upcoming seminars. Yeah. January. Go, go ahead, Joe. No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, we got to plug those uh, January 21st. This, that's a Saturday. Uh, at Bender Martial Arts and Fitness. And then we have um, that Sunday, the 22nd at DuPage Krav Maga. So definitely come out for those. Um, they've been good, great so far, a lot of positive feedback. So we always welcome more people. You can be a beginner and start up. Uh, we it's definitely catered to whoever's there. Um, also, also always, you know, please download, to, go to Tony's website to download digital videos. Um, it's always helpful for support. And we have the memberships as well. So um, 
you know, if at a minimum, if you're enjoying this podcast, if you like the content we have on YouTube, uh, please consider strongly joining our monthly membership sites. There's two levels, the $5, just kind of a thank you level, or the $10, you can get access to additional video content that is not published anywhere else. Um, let's see what else. I mean, and there's also ways to train with Tony personally. You can come out and train with him. Look on his website. We'll, you know, post below in the YouTube links and then in the description. Uh, all on Tony's website, you can find all this stuff. So thanks for that. Yeah, much appreciated. So what uh, last week, today's the last week of the regular season NFL. Um, of course, we know we had that um, big incident earlier this week with Hamlin having, uh, you know, the cardiac event getting apparently when he got hit in the chest, it was just timing of it, you know, in between a heartbeat, I think. Uh, people are claiming a heart attack, but it really wasn't. Uh, I, there's differences. But uh, I, I, I hope I mean, sounds like he's recovering. I don't know if he'll ever be able to play football again. I haven't heard. Um, unbelievable, huh? Yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, and that is not, I mean, it's very uncommon to happen. It's like a perfect timing shot with the right amount of force. Uh, I can't remember what that's, Commodio Cordis. There's a name for that condition. That's what they're speculating that happened. But it happens a lot with like kids in Little League. If they get to catch a line drive in the chest, uh, it can happen from time to time. I shouldn't say a lot, but um, so it's definitely like EMT. They mentioned that this can happen, that, you know, a healthy person struck at the right time. Have you ever seen any of that in, in any fighting in any boxing, something like no, that? Happening? Not, not to my rec again, with my memory, I don't remember that ever happening. I'm not saying it didn't. So just based on what I can remember anymore, I don't remember that, but um, I had found, and I mentioned this to you, that there was a girl that I, she was a grade above me in grade school that I had a crush on. And I haven't seen her since I, since sixth grade, okay, since I was in the sixth grade. So how many years is that? Many, 45 years, whatever, who knows. But I found out she had passed away earlier, well, like 2022. Um, I just found out this week, she was 58. And I mentioned that because I have no connection to her. As I said, I haven't seen her since sixth grade. Um, she had diabetes, apparently. And anybody can pass away at any time. You know, I, I've, I've lost a lot of people through the years. And many of them, the vast majority of them, were not what I would consider elderly. They were under the life expectancy, okay? Um 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even early 70s. Naturally, I've lost people in their 80s and 90s. Um, but, you know, it's, you never know when it's your time. And, and that even in, in, entails getting a bad diagnosis and then lingering for X amount of years. Uh, you know, if you, if you have, there's no time like the presence to, to, deal with your health issues. As you know, with me, I hadn't gone to a doctor since 2009 to my, to my recollection. And because of my mother, I just wasn't able to do anything. So now, you know, I'm doing everything. I'm trying to catch up while I can. And generally, you know, my blood pressure is perfect now. Everything is fine. My cholesterol, I got all, everything is, it's just that I got some injuries. And of course my memory, those are the, those are the two things. But um, I highly recommend everybody to just Get a good thorough checkup, especially if you're embarking on if you're even if you're already training with some martial artist or whatever your training is, you may you still need to get tested. Um, maybe you're stepping up your training. Uh, always get a good good uh, good diagnosis. Even that's no guarantee, but at least you know what you're working with. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's sad when it happens to an athlete in their prime. It's also sad when it just happens to a regular lay person um that that dies before you expect them to it's a shame yeah and i mean even without impact athletes have collapsed i think there's been some soccer and basketball players you know in their prime sure. in college years who just lenny bias was a big name so yeah i mean you, you you never know and even if you're checked out you never know so i mean well look at pistol pete maravich you know he uh, what was he 40 or 42 he, he died after his N nba career in a pickup basketball game i mean he made it through his whole nba career college career uh high school grade school career 
and he dies playing basketball from a heart condition, if I remember correctly, a heart attack or something. Um, some heart related thing, if I can recall, I wasn't prepared to talk about it. So I didn't, I didn't refresh my memory, but yeah. What was he 42 maybe when he passed away? Sad. But yeah. So, I mean, I think about that now being kind of middle-aged and training, because I mean, if you go live on the mats or whatever, you're not going to find a more intense condition, you know, and there's always that thing in the back of your head is that, you know, how far can I push it with my body? And so, uh, I think part of it, you just have to kind of accept that risk. I mean, obviously diet, have the correct diet, um, have your doctor check you out and obviously try and physically keep in shape outside of training. Um, because you obviously you're going to stress test that system. So you want to have a strong foundation, both muscularly and, um, cardio wise. And then, actually I was going to ask you, here's, here's my first question for the day. Um, when approaching weight training, and I know everybody's got a, there's some degree of customization for each person, but as, as a fighter, should your lifting be more towards strength training or more for muscular endurance? Well, I try to do both, but I, I mean, MMA is a little, if you're focusing on the grappling aspect of it, yeah, you want to have some strength. Uh, it, to me, see, to, all right. For me and for the people that I've trained, endurance is 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 easier to come by. Strength is, man, it's it's a treasure. It it takes a long time to develop that strength, um, legitimate strength. I'm not talking drug uh, aided, uh, you know. Uh, but you do want to try to be balanced as a fighter or as a like a athlete where you know, like football or even basketball, where you have, you're, you're combining explosiveness, endurance, speed. Um, you really have to train for all of it. Okay. Now let me preface this by saying things will suffer. So like you probably will not get as strong as you possibly could, but there again, you don't need, there's, there's a point of diminishing returns. I always tell this. I've, I've dealt with some of the strongest men in the world and they, they could lift incredible amounts, but it was overkill for the fighting. They, they were so big, so strong, but their cardio, their, their cardiovascular system was taxed. So there's limits. So you have to find your balance. Uh, and then what kind of fighting are you doing? You know, are you doing strictly sport or are you competing or uh, training for, Self-defense. Self-defense obviously is much more difficult because you don't know who you're going to go up against. You don't know what kind of condition outside it's going to be if there's weapons involved. Um, so let's just talk about that briefly. If you're in a sport world, you know exactly how long you're going to fight. Okay. Maximum. All right. If it's a, let's say five, five minute rounds. Okay. Maximum of 25 minutes. You know that. Well, in a street fight, you you should <laughs> hope you never have to go 25 minutes. I've had to go some in some encounters quite long because multiple assailants, but for the most part, your endurance, I, I'm saying this broadly, okay? I'm not making specifics, but generally, you'd need more um, endurance if you're in a sporting situation because the time limits are there. You you know, in a street fight, you're you're going to hope you know, to end it quicker. On the flip side, you can train and peak for a competition, whereas in a street fight, that can happen at any point in time. So you always have to walk around in some semblance of, of being in, in good shape. So all of this stuff has to factor into your training, right? Um, for me now, or for me, it's just, I want to be, I've always wanted to be strong, but not to the extent where it would hinder my, my fighting abilities. So it's it's a balance, Joe. Mm, yeah, because that's one of the things as I've started my lifting routine, trying to figure out, you know, the more reps or going for the heavier weights and less reps. I mean, I think that's constantly things that people try and think about. Well, I, you can do both. You can do your you could do your working load. OK, and then at the end. Do some lighter weights, higher reps. It, it helps pump and flush the muscles. Uh, I always did that. I mean, I even had Kevin doing that and guys like Chuck Sipes, the legend, um, he did that. You know, this is nothing new. All right. Um, 
So uh, for for me though, now nowadays, I'm I'm not going heavy. Uh, at least I, I I don't plan on it. I, I got injuries and I'm on my own. I, I it's just one of these deals. Whereas, um, I don't I don't have workman's comp. Okay, I don't have anything like that. If I get blown out, I'm just teaching these seminars. So if I injure myself so bad because I'm lifting heavy, then I can't do the seminars. I don't get unemployment. I don't, I don't get workman's comp. So I'm out. So I have to be real careful with what I do. So lighter weights, um, more reps, and I'm just focusing on my fitness. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned injuries and that's something I've had to deal with, not to the same degree, but um, sometimes if I train too much, uh, and even when I'm saying too much, it's not, it wouldn't be a lot for a lot of people, but I just have certain chronic like injuries or, or shortcomings that will in, aggravate if I do too much, you know? Uh, and I, so it's, there's, there's a kind of a part of listening to my body and, and holding back, which is frustrating. Um, you know, I just have to take certain days off. I have this like issue with my hip that if I train too many days back to back, you know, I can feel it. And I don't know if that means long term I'm going to need some kind of hip replacement or something. Um, but you know, I also have a wrist, and it's one of those things that I sometimes I forget about it. But as I amp up my training, it'll it'll come back, and I'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. I have to you know work around this uh, and figure out a routine. So not only are you balancing, just you know, that's just one more I guess variable to work into your training routine is is is, is those things that you know that you're gonna. I think it's flaws in your system that you have to work around. Yeah. And everybody's different, you know, uh, and even if you're not a weight trainer, whatever your sport is, you have strengths and weaknesses in that given sport that you need to develop and, and, you know, focus on. So, um, but I, I really believe in being very well balanced and I've seen a lot of great athletes go down the wrong road. Right. And they're focusing on uh, exercises these are amateur athletes, or these are competitive athletes, and they're focusing on exercises that just won't have the carryover, okay? That just won't matter um, to your fight game. So for I'll make an example that's kind of ridiculous, but let's say, you know, you're a world-class sprinter. Well, your sprinting coach, it, it, there's no tie-in, okay, um, to, to using your sprinting training for boxing or MMA. You can use components some of the fitness, but the actual exercises, working on your starting blocks, you know, how to get out of the blocks quicker and things along those lines. Why would you waste time doing that? Now, I bring this up as a as an example because I've seen guys doing, because their fitness coach want, wants them to do stuff. It literally has nothing to do with fighting, won't make you, won't enhance your body at all. In, in, in anything that would um, help you in fighting. So that's really important, okay, to separate a fitness program that's probably being pushed by the fitness instructor or do, do the exercises that are geared to make you a better fighter. Think of all the champion boxers that we've had through the years. They never did flipping tires or whatever they're doing, you know, climbing ropes. You know, they, mo most of them did uh, bare exercises, you know, not even, not even weight training, right? Not even lifting weights. That was frowned on for decades and decades and decades. Yet they had tremendous skill. They were able to win their, their matches and so on. They did it all without drugs. And hey, man, you know, so there's something to be said about that. And it, it's not, I, I think some of the, in, uh, not the instructors, what do you call them? Trainers. Um, they were misinformed about weightlifting, but weightlifting in this country was relatively new, relatively new. Okay. Um, and a lot of the examples of weightlifters, they weren't very, they use the term muscle bound. Not all of them were, but some of them just weren't, let's say very athletic, but now we know the difference. Now you see some amazingly fit, strong, weight trained athletes uh but again it's got to be geared towards your sport or or your interest 
And that prohibition on uh, weight training, that was mostly a boxing thing. Like, didn't wrestlers almost always lift? Uh, well, it wasn't just, I mean, other sports, did, baseball players didn't lift weights. You know, I mean, um, I don't even know if football players did back back then, right? They may have. I don't know. Um, well, I was involved with Stanley Robin, who who lifted weights, okay? So, yeah, re- wrestlers did. Um, I know Lou Fez told me he did. Uh, of course, if you look through the record book or the history books, you see Hackenschmidt, da-da-da. But you got to remember, some of those wrestlers, they were performance wrestlers. This was all show. So um, professional wrestling drew from that crowd, you know, the big ex-football players or the strong men and, and so on. Um, but, yeah, I would say wrestlers lifted. Uh, I'm sure some didn't. I mean, I knew a lot of wrestlers that didn't lift weights, okay, uh, right? like amateur wrestlers, right? Or if they did, they hated to do it, they hated to do it, but they were, you know, they did their conditioning exercises. But yeah, for boxing, man, it was, I mean, I'm sure there were exceptions, but man, it was, it was frowned upon. It is amazing. The guys were able to get the size and strength they were without weights. That was always, always impressive. It's almost like they must have the guys who were the, the big, strong boxers back in the day must have just been more genetically inclined towards it. Well, they ate properly, um, did a lot of road work. They Boxing is different in that than weightlifting or bodybuilding, I guess, and the fact that you can have, you have such, back then, well, you had your weight categories, right? You had your weight classes that you had to fall in, okay? Um, now, People talk about heavyweights back then compared to today. Well, the the weight category is different now. It's totally shifted. But 165 pounder today, there was 165 pounders in 1950. Okay, 165 pounds and 165 pounds. They may may have carried more body fat percentage back in the 50s. Okay, because they didn't diet down, or didn't maybe didn't do the the incredible diet like they have today but there's also the drugs and illegal and even legal you know like protein powders and you know stuff that they sell at a health food store that may may help you um and then when you get to the higher levels today there's more money involved so that means that you know, a lot of fighters back in the old days and I'm not saying this doesn't hold true for fighters today but they had steady jobs too so they had to work around their work schedule to get their training in. So I guess my point, though, is to answer your thing, they were they were very fit. They had a hard life, and they earned everything that they got on their body. They didn't have as many shortcuts as we have today. Hmm. Like protein powder. You know, that's a big example. That's one that pops into my head. You know, mix it up, drink it. There you go. You got 25 grams of protein, you know, as opposed to, well, I got to make some tuna fish or chicken and I got to cook it up. That's going to take X amount of time. You know, you just, if, if, again, we, we have some luxuries. Well, that's, I think, always the argument when you're comparing athletes from different eras, right? Is each subsequent era, there's going to be advantages. Uh, you know, they're just, you're always, each generation is learning upon the past. And like you said, there's just, uh, different technology, whether it's diet or training wise, that's available. And so it's, it's really becomes an apples and oranges, you know, a boxing champ from the forties, it's hard to compare to like Tyson's era, you know, what he yeah. had available to him. The way I look at it is this, cause I, I don't consider myself having any, having an easy life growing up um, with conveniences. I have more conveniences now. Most of us do microwave ovens and things along those lines, but we have such an advantage because those things didn't even exist. Those things probably weren't even a thought in anybody's head. Um, so for folks today that would say, well, they had, you know, they were harder back then. Okay. Let's say that they are or were. You can make your life as hard as theirs were. Okay. So we could become them. They can no longer be, they can't become us. Right. So we could do without watching the YouTube videos. We could do without the microwave ovens and all of the uh, the amenities that we have uh, in in today's age, right? 
those people back then, it's too late. They're gone. But even if they were, they they don't they never would have had the ability to do what we do today. So yeah, we have crazy advantages um, that that they just don't have. And I don't suggest that we try to live like them. You know, now we're we're, we're more knowledgeable now than we were at the turn of the nineteenth of the twentieth century, right? Um, and let's use that knowledge that we have today. But you know, don't get swayed. I I just got done training Martin, and we were talking about he, these gimmicks that people are falling for to lose weight or this or that. They're just a waste of time and money. Um, sometimes you don't you don't need that. Just good old horse sense will get you to the to the finish line, um, but along the way, don't turn up your back on science and um, make the most of what we can. Work with what we have given to us in the 21st century and try to come out the best you can. Okay, I kind of have another question. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, there's a thing that's been making the rounds for a while. Um, it's a, a in the jujitsu circles. It's a kind of a a list basically, and I wanted to kind of have your thoughts on it and compare it. Not so much as a just to see how you would differ, your approach would differ. And basically, I think this uh, it's a short list of basically like I think it's called the four rules of jujitsu or grappling or I don't even remember what it's called. People will probably realize what I'm talking about as I describe it, but I think it's attributed to Chris Hodder, who was one of the, uh, they called him the dirty dozen, the first 12 black belts for Brazilian jiu-jitsu who are American. I could be wrong about that. Like I said, I'm not a <laughs> historian with that stuff, but I've seen it making the rounds in different in different areas. And basically it's the rule number one is uh, get on top for grappling. Number two, stay on top. Uh, number three, if you're not on top, have a guard that the person can't pass. Now that's one where I think we have a lot of area of discussion. And then number four is don't get so good at rule number three that you forget rule number one and two. And well, I, rule number one and two came from us, okay? I mean, I've been saying this and others before me, you know, 80, 90, 100 years ago, this, you know, you you wanna be on top, okay? that That's just, so this is shocking to hear this because that that goes against everything that jujitsu stood for in the '90s and and all of that because they were they were working off the bottom the bottom the bottom that's a point of advantage and so on. So um, now you always want to try to be on top and especially in a street scenario you definitely want to be on top. Yeah, so I thought that was actually interesting, and I think it's just this guy's way, and I think it's becoming generally accepted. But I think. That message is getting out there now, and it's permeated. Well, good, it should. You know, yeah, but that was one of their flaws. You know, it was just that they couldn't maintain a top position, and they didn't even want to try. They just felt, oh well, I'm on the bottom. He's as long as he's between my legs, I'm in a safe position, and and even that's not even true. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm all for that. You know, uh, as far as <clears throat> getting a guard, like you said, that they can't pass. No, I would. I mean, no, I'm not gonna. No, that okay, good. That's fine, but I would say, learn to get off your back, okay? That's ultimate. Again, try to get back to your feet uh, or just don't be under a guy. A lot of bad things can happen. Um, and especially in a street scenario where a, a man may be bigger or stronger than you, uh, you know, lot, lots of bad things can happen. So you gotta use your, your, your speed or quickness or whatever it is that you have but generally speaking i won't argue with those four things number one and number two are really important try to maintain the top uh or whatever they said but it's all about being on top staying on top if you can um but it's about controlling the situation if you feel for whatever reason it's it's better to be on the bottom then do that by your choice don't be forced to go down there if you were forced to go to your back um then you fail all right. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't um, uh, fix it from here. You know, uh, you still can't you can still maybe emerge victorious, but you failed because you didn't control the situation. So I would change the rules the four rules. My number one rule would be this. Always be in control. OK. That's first and foremost, meaning 
what if, if I don't want to go to the ground, you can't get me to the ground. So I don't care if you're the world's greatest ground fighter. If if you if you can control that person so they can't get you to the ground, you've already wiped that person out. So I would say the most important rule, number one, is control the situation at all times. Okay. That is to me been the most important element in my life coming from what i seen in the streets i mean you never wanted to go to the ground okay i mean it was like this is nuts so yeah i would say control number one and then number two staying on top and you know blah 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 from there that's the only difference that i would make i would shift everything down Mm -hmm. So you would like put a new rule number one and then everything is always be in control. You control the landscape of the fight. If you want to keep it on the feet, you keep it on the feet. If you want to take it to the ground, you take it to the ground, but you should dictate. Okay. And mm. again, if you can't, no shame in that. Like, for example, let's talk primes here. Let's talk people in their prime. So if you're going up against in a fight a Mike Tyson, in his prime or whoever the world's greatest boxer in your prime you're gonna you're not going to be able to compete with that okay no shame you know just because you're but you're, you're probably more well-rounded all right so now you should be able to control the situation to at least take him down or tie him up or or whatever so you can't out slug him but you can use your other tools Conversely, with the world's greatest wrestler, you know, okay, you're not going to take this guy down, you know, so what do you got to work on? Either knocking him out or don't go to your back against the world's greatest wrestler because that's where they want to be home. Scramble, move, footwork, do things that they're not used to doing. So this is what I mean, like weapons. If weapons are involved, all of a sudden that changes. You got to control that situation. So, yeah, I would say control for me, obviously, is number one. And sometimes that control could be being on your back. Well, if you want, if you feel like I would use it for a transitory thing, okay? But again, we're painting with a gosh darn broad brush. So many variables here. But there are people who focus strictly on being on their back. Like they think this is the best place to be. You got to know that is not the best place to be ever, okay? It may be, I mean, generally speaking, all right. In this toxic situation, that may not be the best, but that may be your only alternative. OK, that may your, be your best alternative. So that's what you have to distinguish. OK. Um, for me, it's always being in control of the situation by. Number one, maybe not going to the ground or number two, being on top if I'm you know, on the ground, if I'm on the ground. And then there's subsets of that. Just being on top isn't enough. How am I on top? Where am I at in relation? Okay. Same with being on the back, on the ground, or on the bottom. How are you on the ground? Or how are you on the bottom? Okay. What position are you in? Where is he in relation to you? You know, so there's so many things to, to cover here that is beyond the grasp of this because it's never ending. But if you're on your back, I've always said, I think even on my earliest videos, get a quick submission or whatever you know, hook him, strike him, rip him, or get out. You know, there's always going to be an uh, 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 an avenue to get out, right? They, unless the guy's just smothering you, all right? And then hopefully, you know, when I say smother, I don't mean like restricting your breathing, but then maybe you're safe. Maybe nothing's happening. But you've got to be in control of that. If the guy's just pinning you, holding you down, and you're helpless, Boy, you're in a lot of trouble. You better work on your skills so that doesn't happen again. Once more, back to control. This man's got me down. He's controlling me. I don't want to be controlled. So to answer that, I might go to my back as long as I'm doing it under my control. Hmm. Yeah, and I know there are no absolute answers. I mean, except for the maybe always oh, try and be in control. That's their goal. Uh, that seems to be absolute. Um, and like, if you're not in control, like regain that initiative. Well, yeah, um, you got to hit the reset button. You got to calm everything down, get to, get to a quote unquote neutral state. All right. 
and give it some time to, you know, not like when I say time, not five minutes, but like five seconds or whatever to figure things out. Uh, use your brain to re-strategize here. And, you know, and then if this is a, a serious fight, that's not the time to be self-analyzing all your failures. Okay. That's another thing. Don't self-analyze then because now you're just working against yourself. Just be cool, calm, and collected. Figure a way out of this. Okay. That's where you got to be a MacGyver sometimes, man. And, and do things that you're training. Well, you're training. I shouldn't say you're training, but that rules. You may have to do things that are outside of the rules. That's where your training has to be outside of the rules. Okay. So in essence, you can't have rules all the time because it may get you in trouble in a real life situation. Plain and simple. Hmm. Um, so, and again, I know these, you can't speak in terms of absolute. So kind of honing in on that when you're on your back, um, generally, it sounds like you prefer trying to get back to your feet unless you see like an easy reversal. Would you agree with well, that? Not necessarily a reversal even because reversals can be tough and escape. Okay. Um, or you, you get a, it, you don't even have to get back to your feet. You you've trained with me enough, or you've seen enough of my videos to see how you can transition into arm bars or chokes by getting out, hipping out, not worrying even about a reversal. I mean, if it's there, go for it. All right. But I don't necessarily in, in certain instances, want to reverse the position. It depends on where he's at right now on me. Okay. Um, but my first and foremost thing is getting some space, getting, getting out and getting into a situation where I can do a punishing offensive move, move, be it a submission, be it a strike, be it a rip. Um, that's, that's, that's how simple I, I make things. Okay. And then from there it becomes, that simple thought process becomes very complex because I have a lot of tools at my arsenal, okay? Or at my, in my arsenal, I have a lot of tools that I can use. Um, so then I, all, all of a sudden the, the palette is there for me to create something. Uh, I can't do that if he's got me completely controlled and hemmed in. So I've got to control, I got to open it up. I'm being very blunt here because people will say, well, what about this? What about that? What about, we know. Okay, only a moron would think that there's not one more one. Oh, there's only one way. We know that there's so many ways. The difference between what I do and a lot of others, I have answers for all those different things. Okay, just like you would have an answer for some math problem or, you know, vocabulary or, or something like that. Um, but there are schools out there that don't have the answers. Okay, because they do everything this way. Do it this way, and then he'll do it that way. And then you do it this way. That, that's not life. That's not real fighting. That's not real scrambling. That's regimented, almost kata life. Um, so, yeah, I don't ever want anybody to think, well, oh, there's easy answers. You're going to find that all of a sudden you hit a wall where it fails. Now what? Well, if you're hemmed in by the rules, you're screwed. Yeah, so maybe that's the, the final rule. It's like no rules are absolute. Well, or nothing's people... absolute. Even in even in rule based uh, sports, people cheat. I mean, look at NFL. There's penalty flags and soccer. And don't tell me that you know that doesn't happen. That happens in UFC fights or you know MMA fights in box. Uh, all of it. People sometimes, sometimes you get caught. Sometimes you get away with it, right? But you know you. you you, you, you've got to, you know, I'm the, the, the cliches. We've talked about this once before, how people get so caught up in cliches and memes and all of that. Look, the bottom line is, if you were in control of every aspect of your fighting, if you could control everything, nobody can beat you, okay? Now, there's going to become times where certain things momentarily, hopefully, are out of your control. Try to regain your control. And the way you regain your control is by having a bigger uh arsenal all right having a bigger knowledge base and 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 being being in shape okay you don't have to be in better shape than the person that you're fighting you just have to be in as good a shape as you possibly can okay see that's another thing i don't care what you can lift i mean i've i've snuffed guys who were a lot stronger than me uh 
I don't care what you can do. All I care about is what I can do. If my body can't react the way I need it to, then I failed. And you had nothing to do with it. Matter of fact, I should send you a thank you letter because you're the one who forced me to realize that my body can't pull off what it needs to pull off. Okay. So I think it's deadly important for everyone to get their body where it needs to be. You see what I'm saying? You'll never need to bench 600 pounds in a fight. All right. That's never going to have to happen. So don't worry if the guy you're fighting can bench 600. It don't matter. Okay. That's his deal. You just have to make sure that your body can react as it needs to. Um, and that's going to help you in, 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 to gain control over this person. All right. That's where we're getting back to your original question on tonight's podcast about strength versus fitness or endurance. You have to have your body so it can cover all of that, Joe. You know, uh, you have to be well balanced. That's the best way to be able to control someone. And even with technique, if you spend 80% of your time fighting off your back or training off your back, you're weak. You're not well-rounded. If you spend 100% of your time strictly grappling, you're weak, okay? You're not well-rounded because you don't do the strikes and all of the other jazz, all right? Same with the strikes. If that's all you do is strikes, you're going to be in trouble if you hit the ground. So it, it you got to be well-balanced, but you have to have an idea of what, what does well-balanced. Now, now that I'm well-balanced, how can I make – make a living off of this how, how can i survive in a fight off of this that's by learning how to control yourself and control the opponent that's all i can say all right so sounds like rule number one is be in control number two yeah, and then the other rules are fine you know the other rules were good but you 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 want to control the the fight you just do Cool. Well, I think this is a good discussion on that. I don't know if I have any follow-up questions on that. Um, other things I was thinking about. You know, you often talked about music and how that... Well, wait, let me just add one more thing okay. to that. You know, because I remember hearing this many years ago, and through the years, I should say. Well, if he, like a boxer or a, like a wrestler, I mean, a wrestler against a jiu-jitsu guy or something. Well, if he takes me down, I'll just arm bar him or I'll triangle choke him. What about this? What about, what about saying, well, if he takes me down, I'm going to go back to the gym and I'm going to work on my takedown defense. Okay. That's the idea. Okay. That you may still not be the world's greatest takedown defender, but you're going to be a lot better than if you don't even bother with it. Okay. Um, and, and the same with a boxer. Well, I'll just knock him out. Well, what if you miss? What if you don't knock him out? How about working a little bit on your takedown defenses too, or so on? So I just want to throw that in there. You know, um, don't like um, bury your head in the sand or bury your weaknesses in the sand. Uh, I'm struggling today with my words. My memory's not working well. Don't um, ignore your weaknesses. Embrace them and, and work on them because they'll still, in general, always be your weaknesses. They may never be up to the level of your positives, but they will be less of a weakness, okay? You won't be at a negative 100 with your weaknesses. You might get them up to a negative 20 or something, which in the scheme of life means you can, your, your quote unquote weakness now is probably gonna be dominant over a whole swarm of different types of people. So always keep that in, in mind. Okay, now what were you gonna say about music? Well, I was gonna riff off of that and I'll go back to the thing other time, but isn't it just kind of the, concept of you know you may hope for the best but you've got a plan for the worst so you need those contingencies so yeah my ideal circumstances like if i'm a great striker i'm just going to keep the striking but you have to plan for if that goes south i mean and this can apply to any area of your life i mean outside of fighting right you know whatever it is your financial situation or your uh relationships i mean you have to have you have to you should be willing to look at or you need to not bury your head in the sand, I guess is another way. Or, you know, you have to spend some time saying, what if, what if these things happen? You know, it's kind of, maybe it's like being the Boy Scout, right? The Boy Scout always be prepared. 
um, you know, or survival situations. Like we talk about it, you know, oh, well, I'll just do X, Y, or Z. And it's like, well, you better know each level, you know, like I'll always have a lighter on me. So I won't uh, have to worry about making a fire, let's say, as an example. It's like, well, you should still also have an idea of how to make a fire when those things aren't available to you. Yes, have all the things that you need to conveniently make a fire. And I'm just going to, again, talking from the, you know, wilderness survival aspect. Uh, but you should be exposed to and, and be comf confident in as, but as much as you can be, um, you know, if, if these things are lost to you. Um, so... I mean, that's kind of, it sounds like that's what you're saying, basically, you know, that that ethic should be there is be prepared for the worst. Yeah, there's an old expression, people don't fail to plan, they or they don't plan to fail, they fail to plan, right? Um, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I think some people actually do plan to fail the way their training goes or something. But yeah, you you want to have a working knowledge of of everything possible, right? In a fight. But when it comes to a street scenario, there's always going to be something that's probably, you, you know, you, you, you didn't specifically train for, okay? But that's where you have to become a diagnostician, all right? You, you have to have such an overwhelming knowledge of all the theory of combat, right? That you'll be able to figure it out as you go along. So I always, when people talk to me about this in person, it's like, speech right you never learned how to hold every conversation you're ever going to hold in grade school right nobody planned out and wrote out everything that you have to say for the rest of your life you learned how to read you learned how to articulate um the theory behind all of it right so that you can go into life and and create your own conversations and that's how you have to be with fighting. You have to have such a, such a deep well of knowledge of, of how, like you're doing the anatomy and physiology and everything. All of that has to be studied so you know exactly what works, what doesn't work, how your body moves, how it won't move, um, so that you can improvise, you know? Uh, that's just, you know, you heard me talk about this for 25 years, 30 years about improvising, improvising, improvising. Um, you have to have that ability and it, it's not, you have to practice that. So yeah, it's great if you can use your lighter. Um, but if your lighter's wet or your lighter's out of uh, fluid, now what? So you should be able to say, I'm going to use my lighter only because it's easier to do. Not, well, I'm going to use my lighter because I don't know how to rub two sticks together. That's the thing. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how I look at it. I mean, shit. Even, even, you know, as we all get older, we, our skills naturally are going to um, diminish, but does that mean we just give up? You know, I'm still trying to stay in shape. I'm still trying to keep my brain going with, with fighting scenarios. Uh, it's, you know, it's gotta be a way of life. I was thinking about your analogy of, you, you know, language compared to fighting skills. Um, and I don't know if this has taken that analogy too far, but you know, sometimes like not all language is improvisation, I don't think. And maybe I'm, I'm not a linguist, obviously. So I'm <laughs> just from my experience, um, you know, there are certain introductory phrases, you know, or certain jokes you may know, or like, let's say you're gonna do a pickup line, you're meeting some girl, you're like, oh, this, this usually gets the conversation going. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of other examples, but you get to just, you have that with fighting as well. So like, generally I'm good at X, Y, or Z. Maybe it's, you know, my right cross or my left hook, or I have a really good kick. Uh, and I should use those as my opening move. Like in chess, you have an opening move. Now I'm mixing metaphors to make it even more confusing. Um, but like with language, so there, there are moments like where it's, improvise but they're also and again this goes to maybe you having control if you're initiating let's say you think things are getting hostile and you've got to act that you have some uh you have a handful of pre-scripted things in your head or maybe things that you can draw from saying i'm going to do 
plan A, B, or C, these tend to work, and then see where it goes from there. Like, obviously, you can't predict. I mean, in any fight, there's a level of chaos or any conversation. You don't know. You're only control of 50% of it, and you might be able to steer that person in a certain direction, but you can't control 100% what they're going to do. You have an idea, like the probability is they will do this, but maybe something else happens that's unexpected. So I guess my, my thing is um, when you approach fighting, I'm going to try and summarize this because I think I'm rambling. Are there times when it shouldn't be improvised or there, should you collect some things in advance saying, like, my, I'm going to do these three moves as my opening move and see where it goes and be prepared to improvise if need be? Well, I can only relate it to music, okay? And that is this. Every known jazz musician has what's, when they come to solo, they, they have an outline already in their mind. And what you're, when you're talking about phrases like, hey, doll, or whatever, you know, musicians all have what they call crutch lifts. That's your left hook. That's your knee. That's your elbow to the side of the face. That's your rear naked choke. Those are your crutch lifts. Those are things that you, you've rehearsed. Now it's a question of where do I put them in the solo? And that's how I looked at fighting, okay? I have all these techniques, arm locks, leg locks, neck cranks, so on, punches, bites, this and that. Um, that's where my improvisation comes into play. Sure, I have an outline. And here's an example of an outline, all right? This is winging it. I know I'm going to get into the fight with the guy. Okay, here, here's an outline. Oh, he throws a punch. I, I uh, what do you call it? Um, so when you do this, uh, slip or slip. Oh, yeah. See, I, I'm just having a bad memory day. So I slip the punch. I shoot in. I take him down. I go for a top wrist lock. Let's just say that's that's an outline, right? That's like a perfect scenario. But along the way, that's where your improvising might come into play. Okay, where because things may not go just like that, right? So, uh, so that's an approach, and I do. When I used to talk about visualizing, how to always visualize, visualize, visualize in your training. When you're at the house, when you're in your car, um, you can visualize scenarios like that. All right, visualize it. Visualize blocking or parrying or slipping or whatever it is. Visualize it in slow motion until you 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 can speed it up in your mind. So that's fine. All right. So that may not be part of the improvisation, but in the scheme of everything, unless things go completely as planned, you're going to have to improvise somewhere along the way, all right? So some people have that ability to be creative and their improvisation is better than others. In music, in, in, in speaking, public speaking, you know, with their, how they handle a heckler or this or that, um, and in fighting and, and probably anything else. So those are, those are skills that you can work on. You have to work on. I don't know one jazz musician, not one, that didn't practice improvising. I don't know one. I knew people who, who went to Toastmasters. They all practiced their speeches, okay? They worked on, on, on all of this. Um, so improvising regarding the fighting, you have to practice that. You have to work on that. Okay, don't expect it to come naturally because even if it may, it may not be very good, you know, or you may have gotten lucky, you know, against a slug, but against a world-class fighter or a man who's out to kill you, uh, you know, that's a whole different story. So I wouldn't get too technical on this as far as the verbiage of improvising versus, you know, rote memory. Um, the, the point of it is not everything goes as planned. And you've got to be able to react when shit isn't going the way you want it to go. But it sounds valid to have, like you described, have some outlines of how you try to go things and then be ready to improvise. Well, I think that's common sense. I think we all do that. You know, you practice punch combinations and certain moves. Um, but, what, but what we do differently or what I teach differently is I... I attack the whole body or I look at the whole body at all times. I don't try to just break it down into segments, <clears throat> excuse me, or sections, because now you're missing a bigger picture. Um, so yeah, but absolutely everyone has an outline. I guess if that's what you want to call it for fighting, um, at least I do. 
I, I have a I have a, I have a way that I want it to work out. But I also have thankfully the ability to know if it doesn't, if it isn't going as planned, no, I can I can sw switch gears. Is the um, only way to practice improvising with fighting going live, or are there other ways to develop improvisation? Well, I wouldn't say live, live. The only way to practice improvisation in fighting is by failing, failing lots and lots and lots. Okay. Just like when you're improvising a song, you may play a passage. Eh, you know what? That wasn't very good. I could have done better. Same with fighting. You have to have an opponent, a training partner that you know you're going to experiment with, and your experiments are going to probably fail in the beginning because you're 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 going to say, okay, I have an idea. When I'm cross chest and he brings that leg up, uh, instead of me fighting for the arm bar, so I'm, I'm going to switch into a leg lock. All right, so you're going to try that. Number one, you may blow the leg lock. Number two, you may expose your back and he chokes you out. Okay, or gets the choke on you. So you have to strip the ego, and 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 that and any that, that means from your training partner too. He can't go around, you know, gloating that he got you. You're experimenting, you're trying, and he should be like, man, that's a good thing that you did that, man. It's a good idea. Here's where you made a mistake, and that's how it was with me when I was learning to play jazz. Uh, I'd come up with something. Ronnie Moon, at the this was back in Cleveland. Uh, I try to play a chord, a substitute chord. He's like, well, that's nice, but look, you should go here. Okay. Because now that, that chord isn't where you're going to go from there. Doesn't make sense. So, um, but he, he gave me an A for effort for thinking. Right. So in that regard, yes, that's live. I guess you'd say it, but not like full blast live. Right. I mean, I wouldn't try it in under, under a tournament situation or life or death. Um, but you got to work on it and it's going to take a long time. I can't tell you how long because everybody's different and depends on how much effort you put in. But um, you have to start seeing things, man. Uh, it's just a whole different approach, man. It's just a different way of, of approaching things, Joe. That's for some, they, oh, well, I'm happy the way I'm doing it. Okay, then stay that way. Like, like jazz. Not everybody's meant to be a jazz player. Some people want to just play classical, play it as written, or a country or you know, country music or whatever. Just they 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 want to play you know, simple melodies and nothing wrong with that, man. It just depends on what your what your taste is. But it sounds like in a, you want to find a training environment, and you want to go with the mindset of being experimental, taking risks. Not risks of injury, but no, risks. not risks. You know, so you'd say it wouldn't be a risk to like if you see an opening to try something new that you haven't tried before. Or a, a well, risk. I mean, now you're 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 moving goalposts here. Yeah. I just got done saying in training, yes, you're going to fail because you're practicing something you haven't done. All right, but it won't be a risk. Once you've mastered the art of impro improvising, okay? Sure, the first time you try anything, I don't care what it is. If you've never made a scrambled egg before, you're taking a risk, okay? So that's not what we're, don't move the goalposts on me. If, you're, if we're talking about practice and training, there, are, there should be no risks, okay? Because you're, you're, you're expanding your mind, all right? You know going in that you're experimenting here. So if it doesn't work out, it's a failure, but you didn't risk anything because you knew going in, a risk to me is something where you're going to lose in the end. You're going to lose, irre irretrievably lose. No. I wouldn't try something that, for all right, like a spinning jump back kick. All right, I don't do spinning jump back kicks. So in a fight, I, that's just a move I would never, ever do because now that would be a risk at many, at, at many levels because – I wouldn't land it. I, would, I could fall. I could, who knows what could happen? But you bring Terry Dow on here. For him, it's not a risk, okay? Because that's a move that he's practiced. But now you give me a year, two years of practicing that move, then it's no longer a risk. So when you're practicing in the gym, that's when you should try these things. I would not attempt to do something 
that I've never done before. A, 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 a technique is what I'm talking about that I've never done before in a live like combat situation. I would never try to do it. I may approach it, a, a known move, a move that I've mastered. I don't see it. I, I don't see a problem with trying to do it, but something that I've never done, I'm not going to try to do. Yeah, and I should have been clear. I mean, I was talking in training, obviously, not in, in a real altercation, but I think it's worth clarifying that, yeah, you're not going to try something that is unpracticed or that you're not confident in when you're actually, when your health or your safety is at risk. Right, but that's right. So, but going in, know you're going to fail, okay? Just, this is just, okay, it, it's like this, if I, if I try to catch this and drop it, there's no risk for me, you know, dropping this thing, okay? Because uh, I know that I may not catch it. So the point is when you're training, though, that's the time to do these things, okay? And do them all the time, you know? But a jazz musician will focus on that. They know all their rudiments. They know all the, 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 the scales, the chords. They're very knowledgeable about the theory of music, right? That's where your fighting techniques come in. That's the same, okay? Your techniques are your chords, your scales, and all, all of that jazz. So your arm bars, your neck cranks, your leg locks, your takedowns, your jabs, hooks, elbows, those, you have to know those things, all right? And then you have to start to try to form them as a melody, okay? You have to start, not always jab, cross, up, you know, uppercut, you know, start creating different melodies, meaning do them in different ways and see what works and see what doesn't work, okay? Like not all melodies are pretty. Most songs written probably suck. We won't know because we don't hear them because they suck. The beautiful songs make the top 10, the best songs hit number one and all that jazz. Well, that's what you got to do. You have to have all your, all your techniques, meaning all your theory, and then start to create beautiful melodies, harmonies, whatever. Uh, and, and the only way you can do that is by practicing. And, and every songwriter knows every song he or she writes is not going to be a hit. Okay. They know that is sometimes they get divine inspiration and all of a sudden they, they write a legendary song. That's the same thing with you. Some days you're just not going to have it in the gym. You're not going to have it physically. You're not going to have it mentally. Your creativity's not there. But boy, on the days that they are, that's when you want to strive, okay? Uh, and, and be as creative as you can. The last thing I want to see is somebody's creativity stifled. I mean, give them credit for trying, but be knowledgeable enough to say, okay, here's where you've, this is where you went wrong. Um, this is how you failed. No, it's cool. That was a very good discussion. I hope, I think that was, uh, helped clarify some things for me. And I think it's encouraging to know when you're going to training that it's in some ways you want, you want, you got to be okay with failure. Well, it's all about, I mean, yeah, I, I I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I've failed and I'll continue to fail in my life. We all do. The difference is you get a narcissist that says, oh, I'm perfect. They can't say I'm sorry. They never fail. You're a liar and you're a narcissist if you believe that shit. Um, the, 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 the good thing about failing, if you want to use that word, um, is that it exposes something that now it should become a challenge for you, right? So that gives you another path to go down to work on this so you don't fail again um, or accept it and, and avoid it uh, if, if possible. Now, again, we're not talking street fights here. We're just talking about things in life. Um, but for me, uh, I, I wasn't born with all this knowledge or any physical abilities. You know, all of it was developed and it was fail, fail, fail or gradual progression. And the reason I didn't fail was because I wasn't exposed to the point that I would fail. Meaning your first day in the gym, you can't bench 400. So you're not even going to try. So you can't ever say you failed at benching 400. But through the years, you gradually progress to the point where you're, you're benching 375, 380. Now, today, you're going, you're going for 400. Well, you failed. You didn't get it up, right? But you're close, you can work on it, and eventually you'll bench 400 and no more fail failures. But 
think about this. That day that you benched, you tried to bench 400 and you failed, um, you'd have failed every day of your life up to that point too, okay? So you could have had a thousand attempts at 400 that before that and still failed. You just didn't know you failed because you never attempted it. So that's kind of esoteric, but the point is you don't know what you can fail at until you attempt it. Um, and maybe you're prepared for what you're attempting and you won't fail or you'll be so close that you'll get it sooner or later. So I don't look at failure like the end of the line. I, I just don't. I, I look at it as a challenge that I may or may not want to accept. If somebody right now said bench a thousand pounds, oh, I can't bench a thousand. I never could, never will. I mean, okay, so I'll fail at it. Big deal. I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. But um, that's just how I always looked at things, man, because I, I was used to, and even when I succeeded as a kid, I was never given credit. Nobody in my life, not, I can't point a finger at one individual, but my family, everybody, nobody ever gave me any accolades. Oh, good boy, good job, boy, you know, a boy. I never heard any of that shit, okay? It was always, well, somebody else can do better. Or it was always a put down at the end. So that just, you know, I, I never was in it for the glory. Some people are. They they need that accolade or they need that, um, you know, the attaboy thing. I, I never got it in my life. And you know me 20 some odd years ago when I was training, I was rough, man. I, I would never give any compliments because that's the way I was raised. I've mellowed now because, you know, I realize people can't, they want to be patted on the back. Um, but everybody's different, Joe. But don't don't be afraid to not succeed. You know, just if, if it means enough to you, keep trying. What else you got? For you? Well, that's about it. <laughs> I'll just say that reminds me a little bit of the phrase, um, you know, if you ask a question, you kind of show ignorance for a moment. But if you never ask that question, you have ignorance for the rest of your life. You know, if you're not going to try these things or, or uh, put yourself out there, you know, there, there's just moments like that. Yeah, if you don't try a certain thing, you'll never know. And I think similarly, and again, we <laughs> We were kind of talking down on cliches before, but the one of, you know, in training at least, um, uh, I'm trying to think of another example, but I always think of it in training is, um, you know, either you succeed, you know, or you learn. So if you've failed, you should use that as an opportunity for learning. Use, you know, always look at that as, as a, it should always be a positive. Basically, you're still evolving forward is what I take from that. So yeah, either you, either you win when you're competing or you, uh should learn yeah and that's not easy okay um like shooting pool you missed the shot well but but why what did i do wrong how did i miss was it was, was, was my stroke off what, what 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 went wrong and sometimes if you don't have someone or something let's say a video camera whatever it is to point it out um you'll go continually, you know, grasping at straws or blind at it um, and never know why you fail. So it's great, yeah, to fail if you know why. Uh, just like when you brought up the jujitsu, the three, the four steps or whatever, you know, I I'm not opposed to that. I think that's great. I just find it funny that now they're talking about staying on top. Um, but I really believe that if you can control and control yourself first, Okay, you can't control somebody, and I've said this a million times. You can't control someone until you can control yourself, right? So control, control yourself, control your body, learn to control the opponent, and then things will start to fall into play or into place. Okay, but um, though, though that's that's my attitude on, on on the thing. But if you're a jujitsu fan listening, follow that guy's four pieces of advice if you'd like you know everybody has their own opinions based on their life experiences and um you know my, mine are different than others uh theirs conversely are, are different than mine but what what's worked for me is 
just trying to be as much as in control, um, you know, as I can and, ma and making you defensive, making you reactionary. But anyway, since it sounds like you want to wrap it up, we'll wrap up this podcast until next week. Um, stick around afterwards, Joe, because I got a couple things now I remember that I got to talk to you about. But I wanted to thank everybody for continuing to watch us or listening, listen, listening to us. Um, we're in the process now of trying to get some more guests lined up for this year. Um, and man, I really do enjoy doing these podcasts. So thank you everybody for for supporting us. What do you got to say, Joe? No, I had a really uh, uh, enlightening conversation. I was really glad we had this talk today. And yeah, we'll keep trying to get uh, new guests and returning some old guests, hopefully for the yep. new year. Um, definitely keep an eye out for seminars. If you're looking to host one, reach out to us. Uh, we're trying to set up our 2023. Uh, and again, you know, on social media, uh, click like to support us or on your podcast platform, give us good reviews. All those things help. Uh, so we appreciate your support. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>